one. So we are live. This is always the exciting bit when you're kind of waiting for people to join and like see who kind of pops up. But it's really strange because we're streaming to LinkedIn and also to YouTube. I can't always see who's there. But like it says to me now that there's four people, whoever you are, please don't be shy. Pop a hello in. Say hello to Christina and I. We don't bite. So uh <laughs> And we also were too far away, even if we did. Also true. Also true. Yeah. So please feel free. Just come and say hi. We're here. We're really looking forward to having a chat today. I was going to say, like, give that Friday feeling, but it's a little bit yes, early to give the Friday feeling. Yeah, we it's, can still it's, give it's, the Friday feeling. It's fine. We can still give the Friday feeling. We yeah. can always give the Friday feeling because we are in that space. We're happy. Hi. Uh, we have we have our first hello. Thank you to Misha for not being shy. This is. I love it. Anybody else, don't be shy. We're here. As we're going through, like, I'll warn you now, Christina and I can talk for not only minutes, days, hours. but hours. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> so, so um, please, please feel free to interject with questions. Hi, Otto. Put... So nice to see you. I can see Otto. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know you, Otto, but hi. Thanks for joining. <laughs> Hi, Mariana. Thank you so much for joining. No, this is this is this is the best part. So Christina and I can really talk for hours, days, years, months. I got it even and in makes the sense, order. Usually a little bit. Yeah, it, it, it makes sense. And, yeah. and even if we go off on a tangent, we somehow find a way to bring it back. So yeah. please feel free to interrupt, interject the whole bit. Um, for anybody who does, like, I'll do a brief introduction as people are joining, just in case. So for anybody who doesn't know me, I'm Leanne Meyer. I'm the managing director. Of LM Consulting, and we specialize in promoting gender representation, gender equality in the workplace, but in a way that makes sure black women and women of color aren't left behind. So that's like really our focus. And some of you may know, but I run this series. Today's series is Making an Impact, Humanizing Sustainability, which I think we all are, are aware that the word sustainability has become a little bit of a buzzword in the same way that the word diversity has become a buzzword, in the same way that inclusion has become a buzzword. And for a lot of people, they don't kind of log into dial into what that means especially within the corporate context and this is one of the reasons why Christina and I are sitting down because one of the key parts in really being able to work with anybody is for them to really connect to be able to make an impact and to make a change it fundamentally has to resonate with your audience on some level and that's where we get to. So I am going to let Christina, because uh, let me tell you guys, you're in for a treat today. You are in for a treat today. I am so excited and honored to have Christina on. Um, so Christina, come on. Like I wrote, I wrote a little bit about your bio, but still kind of, I think everybody needs to fully appreciate who you are, where you're coming from and all these good things. Okay. So, well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. It's, it's, it's such an honor and a pleasure. Um, yes. So I am, well, now I am the managing director of a, a, an advisory firm called BST Impact, which uh, was created last autumn. Um, it was me and at that point, two like-minded women who decided that we wanted to take our experience from the public sector and bring that into the to the private sector environment, be it for investors, investees, uh, asset managers and as asset owners. And the background to that is that we're all international lawyers um, and I have 20 years of experience by now in the in the public sector i was 20 well i was 15 with the un with the international organization for migration now the un agency for migration um and the past 10 of those i was heading the international law uh, unit in that organization here in, in geneva where i'm based in headquarters um and over the past years we were seeing both the un engaging the private sector or trying to engage the private sector and the private sector being more interested in multi-stakeholder engagement, at least at some level. Um, and I think that those of us who've been doing, now I say doing sustainability, but sustainability is many things, but to a certain extent, working on sustainability issues for a very long time, ever since we came out of university, basically, which for me is a very typical. Um, it, it was a little bit stunning how much talk there is about sustainability or about uh, 
ESG or SDGs, but less of in-depth knowledge of what that actually means. Um, so what we found was that there was a lot of, as you say, hype about the words. I think that's, that's different categories. You have the people who really want to do something on this, then you have the people who found out that I think this is the next, next big money maker because there's so much regulation coming out of it. There is so many people scrambling around in the dark, find, trying to find out what it is. So it's sort of easy to plaster it in your title somewhere. Mm -hmm. And then there are those who really, really want to try to do better, but are all of a sudden being asked to speak about sustainability with completely different backgrounds. I mean, let's say you have been doing investment and I say investment broadly because that is not my field of competence. And then all <laughs> of a sudden you're being asked to do indicators on social sustainability. And I understand the frustration and I understand also a little bit the panic. And we then decided to establish BST uh, in order to offer our experience, which is a combined 40 years of experience in how to use international norms and standards, specifically human rights, labor rights, but also standards on, on anti-trafficking, on human beings, anti-smuggling, law of the sea, in order to make the societal and governance part of ESG which is part of the SDGs, uh, much more tangible and really hope that that, can, that experience can be of use for people who want to do better and have an interest in doing better on the sustainability side instead of just saying, oh, we are now an ESG fund and not really changing anything. Right, right. Because I th and I think I think one of the main parts to really extract out of that is the, the the authenticity piece. It's the fact that you know if you're going to make change, there has to be a genuinely authentic interest in making that change. You have to want to do it because ultimately that part, that humanizing part, that element where you really lock into the reasons why you're making this change. If you don't have, if that piece isn't there, then you're not really going to be able to go into it for the long haul. Because what we know, and this is irrespective of which which direction it is, whether it's sustainability, whether it's um, racial inequality, whether it's gender representation, we know that to make an impact, to make a change is fundamentally uncomfortable. Yes, I think it's also, I mean, what I run into a lot is um, that, people really either I think you have two sort of sets that those who say can you help me go do a better report uh, and get a better rating I'm like yes if I can also look at your strategies and policies and what your internal governance system is and what do you do if things go wrong because I think what we really come with our experience is that you can't change the day the world from one day to another it, it takes it takes time right. it takes you know the small steps that you need to get right and then sometimes you get them wrong but then the question is what do you do when you get them wrong it's right. about having those systems and being accountable being transparent uh having multi-stakeholder engagement being willing to listen being willing to engage for instance regulators on more than this cost us too much or this is not possible or this is going to not make us enough money but saying okay if we want to be sustainable these are the things that are actually feasible in today's world in this area for instance either production or investment or geographical area and have that sort of engagement so I think that you have those and then you have those who just say well can I just get a better report and I know without actually taking that willing or having that willingness to engage and also realize that that there is nobody who is not having to deal with sustainability issues and speak sustainability in the SDG sense so not right. in the exclusive environmental sense that has also mm -hmm. been understood, right but for me and that might also because I'm sort of new to this environment. Sometimes I do wonder if people have forgotten what E, S, and G stands for. It's not, right. it's not just a la label. I mean, it <laughs> says society. It says right. governance. So you right. can't just say, can I get a better rating without looking at what is it that you're actually doing to the societies where you operate, in the societies where you're investing, and what is your <laughs> governance on these issues? Because then otherwise, I mean, let's, let's just remember the words that those letters actually connect to. 
Right. No, and I, I think the point that you've made just there is a really strong one. It's not just about your effect on society where you live, or when I say where you live, I mean in the sense of the, the company that you run. It's not just about the governance of within the company that you run and existing. How do you have an impact on those companies where you invest, in those countries where you invest? What is your societal contribution? And I really like the way you broke down the the, the relationship between the S and the G in in the sense of saying, you know, the governance is the way you communicate to that because I didn't actually ever think about it like that. That is, uh, that is genuinely um, a really good way of breaking it down because I think, you know, people take, I know obviously a lot of people talk about the S and ESG, but really the way you've put it together, is like it, you can't have one without the other. You can, you can choose to focus. You can choose to focus on one but you can't ignore the other two no. in lieu of focusing on one. And I was also saying you can always choose to focus on the E or the S depending on your investment portfolio or depending on your uh, your production. Let's say if, if you're an energy firm, obviously you are going to focus mostly on the E, but you cannot forget that, let's say, you want to do more clean energy and transform in from, from let's say, fossil fuels to hydroelectrics. I mean, if you build a dam, in a country with populate well not not only in a country with an indigenous population i'm just using the indigenous indigenous population as an example because usually they are discriminated and have less of a voice unfortunately so it's easy to build a dam in one of their sort of like habitats and just displace right. them i mean that's a huge societal impact you cannot effect, right? ignore. No, like when you invest or when you produce solar panels obviously you're main impact is going to be green, it's going to be the environment, but producing solar panels takes quite a lot of water. So if you do that in an environment where there's water scarcity, then you deprive your communities around you of water and that has a societal impact. So I think, yes, you can you can decide to to focus mostly on one of them, but you can't ignore the other and you cannot do either good E or US do good S without having governance. I mean, that's just not right. possible. Things don't right. happen just like, oh, I've decided to do well today. Right, so what's the internal <laughs> process for doing well? You know? And when things go wrong, what is it what that you, do you do, do? To, to address them? No, and that, that's, that's, a, that's a really, really powerful point because I think, you know, in terms of committing and really going deeper I think a lot of people get caught in the headlines as you said you know we're doing this really great environmental thing and nobody's taking it away from that but to your point mm -hmm. if you're drilling deeper and you're actually looking at a your society or I should say b your societal effect and what determines where you choose your location what determines how you decide to let's say instead of displacing a, displacing an indigenous community have you then said we won't do that we will try and find somewhere else it might be more expensive for us but then we can truly put our hands up and say we have done something in line with and we are exactly. sustainable and let's say it's not an indigenous population but a population living in a certain area that has that does not benefit from this specific sort of protection that any indigenous population ought to benefit from but you still just can't displace them there needs to be a regulation there needs to be an, an an balancing act between the benefits of having this dam put in place and then dislocating these people and what's the plan then so that you can actually relocate them in a way that makes sense for them property mm -hmm. rights health education jobs are you doing something so that that will be recreated wherever it is that these people will end up living? Right, right. No, that that is that is like for me, that's a really strong learning takeaway because even myself, you know, you think about ESG, you think about it as it pertains to you and as it pertains to the your view of the world. But actually it, it isn't this, and in terms of like impact and being going deeper it isn't it's nothing that you can undertake and expect a quick solution no. it's nothing that it's it's actually and this is to your point the importance of building metrics and building governance and building a robust framework a sustainable framework because fundamentally you will have to keep going back and forth to keep measuring a your your progress but b to see am i actually still going in the direction no, I that i had you. originally planned yeah yeah. And also something that, that shocked me a little bit is how much ESG investing is being done based on exclusion. 
because you get a better rating, you look better because I only invested in something that's nice and clean. Uh, mm-hmm. But what you need to do if you really want to work towards the SDGs and say we work towards sustainability, then it's invest in difficult areas geographically and difficult um, uh, sectors where you right. can actually make progress. I see so many being afraid of touching, for instance, the extraction industry because extraction is, is dangerous and it's it's dirty and it's very often unregulated. But if you want to actually make a difference for people around the world, then you mm-hmm. need to invest in those companies that are willing to make the in- effort to do better because the more right. you regularize a sector, because you can't, I mean, obviously you cannot invest in uh, illegal mining in, in DRC and, and then, you know, sort of expect the armed forces to just play ball. Right. That doesn't happen. That right? Doesn't go, you, right. <laughs> but you can then invest in those mines that are perhaps not doing particularly well, but are willing to actually engage in how do we do better? How do we right. avoid right. that children are exploited? taking into consideration that in many areas around the world, children do need to work. You know, I think that's something, mm-hmm. sometimes you, the, the KPIs and, and, the, and the standards are also being set by people who are very privileged, uh, mm-hmm. live in London, New York, and Zurich, and have no real experience in sustainability work worldwide. So they mm-hmm. just think, oh God, children working, we can't touch that. You need to touch that because you need to 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 oblige your investee to do better, but not just to kick those kids working out of whatever it is they're working in because they're going to end up in the street, they're going to end up in mm-hmm. trafficking, they're going to end up recruited by armed forces. Because when we talk time labor in certain areas of the world, it's not because they're taken from a nice little private school and shoved down the mine shaft, right? It's right. because it's a question of survival. Of right. Exactly. So what are the, the measures as a, let's say, relatively powerful economic company you can act or investor you can set up so that kids are not exploited but allowed to work? What are the, what are the indicators for, for age? What are the, what is the engagement you can have with civil society, for instance, on education, on health? There's a lot of small things that may look daunting because you've never thought about these things. But, right. And then, I mean, we're just using extraction as an example because it's pretty, it can be pretty outrageous, but you also have the textile industry, for instance, which can also mm-hmm. be extremely outrageous, where right. you have child labor, but you also have, like, the, simply, <laughs> simply, adults being utterly exploited in in that sector and if you for instance have a global supply chain or a global footprint as uh, as a company and you in your reporting say we work towards the sdgs and then two that line sound in that report you say we follow it national legislation on labor standards i mean it takes me half a day to stop laughing or crying i don't really know because unfortunately in many in many countries over the world that labor legislation and specifically its implementation it's not working towards the SDGs. If it was, we wouldn't need the SDGs. So it's a question of saying we uh, we follow ILO standards, International Labour Organization standards on Mm -hmm. minimum wages, maximum hours, um, health and safety, and not think that that means that you cannot save money outsourcing to third world countries. Obviously you can, because the living wages will be less than if you only have your production in Germany or Switzerland, where you have like Swiss and German wages, but you still need to pay a living wage. You need to be sure that people have time off and not have people sitting, well, in diapers all day because they're not allowed to take a toilet break. Because that's a reality. And sometimes I think that reality gets completely lost in the... We've planted trees discussion. Yes. It's very important to plant trees. It might be even better not to fell them, but let's face it, they have been cut down, so it's very important to say. But there are things that are really actually in this moment happening to people like you and me that needs to be addressed. 
Agreed. And I think and I think to to add to your point, I think one of the most important one of the most important um, things that you're doing as part of your advisory is the education piece, because for me, in my role um, within LM Consulting, it's that the part that you have to bring is that knowledge piece. It's opening eyes, ears, doors to the you know hearts and also wallets to the fact that in order to make a change, you have to you have to understand where the issue is you have to understand like to your point I don't I think I even read an article I think it was like two or three days ago talking about child labor where they were saying you know in a lot of countries child labor isn't exploitation it's it's part of survival and they were even comparing it you know to like Britain I think they were even saying you know pre-war Britain children did work they you know people had larger families children did work it was all part of everybody pulling together not exploitation but it's it's that level of understanding culture understanding local culture but then also saying we're going to commit to doing more than just saying as you said local labor laws allow us to do this which basically means we can do what we want we're abiding by local laws but are you working in the interests of the people locally and how how can you then reconcile that Exactly. And then it depends, exactly, depends on the size of your company, the size of your investments and what, but not even the size of your investment, because if you can't invest very much, then perhaps invest in something that actually is willing to engage. Uh, but I think it's also mind sort of like changing and mindset saying there's a lot of, there's a lot of very, very wealthy people uh, and, and investors who invest for maximum return on, on investment and then do charitable work. Right. And I'm like, that is just, I don't want to say just, but I did just sit. I'm saying just. <laughs> you said just, send, but it's okay. Sending, send, oh, throwing money at people because you want to feel better. And right. unless you actually engage those people and see them as rights holders, people who have the t- decision power, people who should participate, people who you are accountable to, then that's not really in the spirit of the SDGs and then isn't it better instead of giving those like two or three million and say then say okay I'm taking two or three million less on my return but I'm investing in something where these people are then actually being empowered and I will invest in the companies that do uh, do follow uh, minimum standards according to ILO not national standards for instance and if you think about hardly anybody who does not work in the health sector or on health material or what have you, are reporting that they are working towards the SDG on health. I mean, hardly anybody. If you think about it, if you do something to have clean water, you then don't do something only on clean water and sanitation. You actually contribute to better health. You contribute to education because healthy children can go to school. But also if you have, let's say you have even a minor, um, factory or you invest in something even that's just implying like 20 people in a country where access to healthcare is difficult or scarce and you have a doctor come in once a month to see how is your how is your staff doing perhaps even extend it to their families you had a real impact on 20 people's lives and how much did that cost you as a company not very much and if you have 500 people working for you then you had a real impact on 500 people's lives and you can report it and i'm all for reporting it in your nice shiny report where for now you're just saying you're planting trees right right because this is this is the point about humanizing it is we have to understand that everything all the sdgs are there because they create a direct impact on people's lives it's not just there as a shiny you know that it's not just there as a little shiny bullet point that we can all add on our websites and say hey this is something really great that we align to it's because there are very real very scary very large very painful experiences that sit underneath all of that for people not not exactly. not an, not almost exactly. collective but for people just like you and I and it's not to say that to today right now we're in the same situation but the point is is that there are people that are living these lives so what might feel like nothing to us I still I still remember reading the book uh, the book factfulness and you mm-hmm. know it was talking about you know we all perceive and uh, as I said generalization everybody so I'm not saying we genuinely do no. that but just based on the precept of the book 
that most of us in the West, we perceive poverty as being, you know, people don't have anything at all. But actually, there are different levels. But mm. someone having how much a person who lives on five dollars a day, depending on where they come from, is relatively middle class. They have they have wheels and that might not be a car. It might be a bike. They have running water. They have all these different things. And when you look at it in that context, that people, whole families live on five dollars a day. When you look at that in a in a human context and the contribution of what companies can do, planting trees are amazing because it saves us all in the long run. But when you look at the pounds, shillings, pence, dollars and euros, there's a lot more that can be done on a human level if you look at it. If you can take somebody from living on one dollar a day to living on five, you move them into, you know, a level of life where they can provide education for their children because they can afford it. You're looking at having clean water, as you said, and then it all comes together. So now for me, you've even opened up my eyes in terms of what are the, you know, I always say asset managers, you know, anyone who manages money, they always speak about their fiduciary responsibility to their clients. But there's 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 a human element to that. You have a fiduciary responsibility, the interest in other people, the interests that sit at the very bottom, not with a monetary payoff, but with a payoff of impact and changing their lives, which is then a huge multiplier. Yeah, but also then from from a from a market perspective, and here I'm then turning into something that's not necessarily my field of competence. So if I'm saying something that's completely wrong, just disregard it. But I, <laughs> I'm think, sure someone will tell, someone will tell us. Well, be like, no, Christina. <laughs> well, I would think that if you, for instance, feel the pressure from regulations such as the EU uh, financial uh, sustainable financial disclosure regulations now right we say that you need to prove that you did no harm then you do need to start thinking about okay is planting trees enough or do I need to think about labor rights social rights even civil rights so that for instance if you invest in a country where it is prohibited to unionize or it is prohibited to have freedom of speech in your investees, you can say, I want not necessarily formal unions, because that would be dangerous for you and your employees. But I want to see a process internally that ensures a complaint mechanism if something goes wrong with your labor. So that right, you, right. you don't create a new you don't create a union because that would be difficult for everybody, it would be even dangerous in some settings. But you can say, I want to see processes internally, so I know that your labor force has redressed internally and then you are actually really offsetting a lot of damage that's being done either because let's say of corruption or fear or what have you in that, that society so you have a lot of power of, of really helping people establish also a civil society and that is something that i would think also from an investment perspective on a longer term also on a shorter term let's start with the short term the millennials whom I find to be extremely young. I think they're not. Okay, well, uh, can you, before, before you go, apparently, I just have to share this. Because I'm born in 84, I'm apparently a millennial, so I'm not that young, if that somehow helps. You're very young. Very young. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. But, I mean, yeah, exactly. I'm more and more, as, as, a, as, as a consumer and as customers, looking into what are you actually doing in your supply chain and if you're not doing well they are going to go to somebody else so there's a huge potential risk in losing customers if you start don't start proving that you are also socially sustainable but also from you know i mean blackrock just came out and said that they're going to look into human rights practices when they invest i don't know exactly how much i mean (laughs) <laughs> but they said it, and it's BlackRock, so it's going to have a huge trickle out of it. Germany, if I'm not much mistaken, just passed a law ahead of the European Union on human rights due diligence, and that if they see that investors or companies are violating human rights in their supply chain, there will be fines, and they could even be quite high. You mm-hmm. can lose your license to practice, not your license to practice, your license to operate. These are real financial risks. But right. it's also, I'm also thinking, if you invest in, 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 in companies that actually pay decent wages, respect social rights, you're also contributing to lifting people out of poverty. And mm-hmm. people who are lifted out of poverty spend money. 
So unless you're provide or producing luxury goods for which you have a market in no matter what country because you have the super rich. But if you're if you're producing anything or investing in anything that's daily life, so I mean, I would bet that there are more people buying chocolate cookies for tea in Switzerland and Norway than there is in broadly speaking Russia, because right. broadly speaking the poverty level in Russia for the general population mm -hmm. is much bigger. So they will say no to the chocolate cookies. Whereas in Oslo, we will have our chocolate cookies, right? Because we can afford that little luxury. So you also create markets for that sort of lower middle class that you will be creating instead of having people, as you say, living on one dollar instead of five. Right. And to your point, that's the, that's the interesting point. I think someone asked, uh, Dave, I will share it in the comments afterwards, the details for the book, Factfulness. But this was even the point that it made in this, this book about the different levels of poverty is that once people have this, let's say $5 a day, they come to the point where they have communication tools, i.e., you know, at the point it was written mobile phones, but who knows, it might be like, um, I was going to say VLAN, it might be Wi-Fi so that they can kind of connect with the rest of the world, which then leads to consuming. And we're not saying that consumerism is the point. What we're saying is it's having the option to do it. And by helping and lifting people out of poverty, you still positively contribute to the economy because I think for me as well part of the part of the framework is how deep are how deep is the regulation going when it's creating this ESG framework because to your point is it basically saying as long as you make solar panels then this is if a company making solar panels is fine okay fine so everyone who invests in a company that makes solar panels has done a good job or is it that part that goes down and says but where are these solar, solar panels being oh, yeah. yeah yeah no exactly and I think, and I think I this just, is what we all need to we all yeah. need to kind of learn, and we all have to be active about. And and this 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 applies to me as well. We all have to be active about educating ourselves, in in understanding what is the what is the act the the action the reaction the consequence. How does this all how does this all piece together? Because. Yeah. You know, they say uh, climate issues, our gender issues, our social injustice issues, all of this, all of this pieces together. So how does it piece together? And I think we all have to be a lot more curious in our understanding as people as well as business people. Yeah, yeah. I just saw that there was a question from, from Otto saying, looking at a company with an international yeah. supply chain, isn't it rather difficult to have a look at all the countries of the supply chain if the S, for instance, human rights and labor rights is respected and what the advice would be? Is that, yes. So my real my advice is take it step by step. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what we do in BST when we advise is to say, okay, so first of all, there are countries that will be more at risk and raise more red flags, which will make us advise on stronger internal monitoring mechanisms, linking up with due diligence uh, people who actually know about these things uh, to actually go and say, yes, we have, a, we have a factor here, what's actually happening. So some countries will raise more flags, some sectors will raise more flags. And then be transparent about what are the, at the beginning, what are the processes you are setting in place to investigate and what are the processes you are setting in place to take action when you discover that things go wrong. Don't pretend or don't expect from yourself that you can solve all the problems right. because you're becoming on, or you're coming under this pressure. It will take time. But the first step you can do, it, it's a little bit the equivalent. I mean, I've been working with governments for my entire career. The first step to, to rectify something or to, to, to make certain, try to make certain that things are actually happening in the right way is passing legislation, right? That's the first step a government takes. So as a company, the first thing you do is you, you, you create your own internal mechanisms and you partner up with the people who actually know about these things. And then you start investigating. And let's say if you are big, big, if you're multinational, then the excuse to say, oh, but we have supply chain all, all over the world. So that, yeah. yeah, but you're multinational. So you also have like quite a lot of people working for you, right? <laughs> so, uh, but then you also have smaller companies, obviously, that do depend. And then I would say engagement. It's engagement and it's transparency. Be ready mm -hmm. to engage your supplier and say, we want to know this, 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 and this, and this. And I'll be happy to provide that company with a list of things that they should ask. 
and then see if your supplier is engaging or if they're just saying, oh, we don't care. Most suppliers are not going to say, oh, we don't care because they don't want to lose the business. And this right, is going right. to be obligatory for anybody who either ex uh, import into Europe or is based in Europe very, very soon. So be ready. But then also, for instance, let's say you produce, let's say you sell T-shirts, cotton T-shirts. Then are you thinking of a producer? Huh? I said, are you thinking of a certain large retailer who's so suddenly? I, 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 I might have, but my my years in diplomacy have have taught me not to say any it names. Is. I was actually yeah. I was actually quite shocked when I mentioned like Oslo and Russia. I was like, oh my god, I mentioned names. I usually never yeah. actually, like country X, you know. <laughs> um, so if you are somebody who sells cotton T-shirts, what you start by doing is to say, okay, so here is why my, where my cotton T-shirts are being assembled. How does that look like? I mean, that's a direct link I have. Now, this is what I have found out. So in this, this factory, everything is more or less fine. This factory seems we have problems with, for instance, uh, discrimination against a certain uh, ethnic minority. What do we do in order to, to, to promote more inclusion here? Um, we don't know where the cotton is produced. Or we know where the cotton is produced, but we don't know how. Be upfront about it. You know, say, we don't know this yet, but these are the processes we have in place to figure it out. And this is what we are requiring of our suppliers now in six months, in 12 months, months and in 24 months. Because there are things you can, you, can, you can do right away. I mean, I just read a report, and I'm really not going to say by whom, and it made me sort of, I don't really, really know what it made me do. I think I said a lot of bad words because they said that in 2030, they wanted to have 50% women employed and now they have 30%. Now I can, I can see that that's a little bit of a long term to go 20% up, but I also, I can understand that. Okay. It was, it's a specific sector where I can see that perhaps you don't know, you don't have an enormous amount of women professionals. I can see why that can take time. But then they said by 2030, we want to eliminate the pay gap. And I was like, I'm oh. sorry, that's an executive decision. That's something you can do from today to tomorrow. tomorrow. So don't bullshit me on this one. <laughs> yeah. So I think that you know there are things you can really realistically do from one day to another. And then yes. there are things that will take like five years. And right. but, but transparency, engage, multi-stakeholder engagement, also engage with your NGO community, engage with your local actors to figure out what is the best way of doing things. Because for instance, in, in many countries in Southern Europe, the agricultural sector depends on irregular migrants, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if you as an investor all of a sudden say, I don't want to see irregular migrant workers in my industry's business, well, first of all, you'll never get your, your, your tomatoes. I mean, forget about them. But you will also then perhaps uh, oblige that MSD in saying, okay, then you're all off, out, out you go. And they will just get either caught into trafficking of some sort, or they will, well, they, they might already have been trafficking. But, but I mean, let's not get into the details. Let's, 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 let's that. That becomes too much. <laughs> but to say, so what is the possibility of regularization? What are the dangers of going to the authorities in these issues? Involve the local NGOs, involve local authorities that are ready to engage, and then figure out what is the best way of getting your tomatoes picked, respecting uh, labor legislation, even for people who are not regular, because it's not because people are not regular that they don't have labor rights. And right. then think about, for instance, supporting a program for when we talk tomatoes for seasonal workers seasonal migration because you don't need to regularize people forever it can be seasonal workers it can be temporary workers there are loads of possibilities and you cannot do this from one day to another without necessarily on without being sure that you don't put people at danger so the engagement and the dialogue is super important Right. And I think that I think you said some you said loads of things that are important. Like I don't even know where to start with everything you said. So I'm going to try I'm going to try the easy bit first. So the easy bit is and I think and I think this is a, a really applicable point when you're doing anything that's involved with making a change is you don't have to change the world in a day. No. You have to but you have to be clear on. Oh, Otto says thanks. You have to be clear on your um, you have to be clear on your intention, but also not use your intention as an excuse for a lack of action. So yeah. I think, you know, I think somebody, um, I'm, I'm not sure who Murros Associates is, you always have to show to, you do your best to influence as per, 
and and I think you know I think in a lot of cases I, I putting the UN um, human rights guidelines aside for two seconds, I think we have to move past just wanting to show your best. I think it has to be being proactive in trying to seek an answer. And that might be your best and you might not be getting feedback, but there has to be a level of proactivity proactivity and transparency comes you know being transparent requires proactivity being engaged requires proactivity it's not going to happen just like any sort of correct course correction whether any sort of injustice has to be proactively sought okay. it cannot be sat upon and it's also dynamic it's something that you know what I advise what you advise today yes it's relevant but it's always against the backdrop of a very dynamic changing um back background exactly oh Hi, Pat. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's always it's always against that background, and I think sometimes people kind of companies don't want to commit because what if we get it wrong? Well, doing nothing means you've already got it wrong. Because yeah. doing nothing means you're still a part of the problem. You're still willing yeah. to ignore what is going on now. Yeah, but I think that also goes back to you know when I honestly when I started out 20 years ago when I studied law it was quite clear we, we got out of law school oh I, I think I just revealed my age um, <laughs> well, <laughs> I, just, I just have to tell an anecdote so the other day I realized that I was now in my 20th year in the in the labor market I was like oh I don't feel like I feel completely immature and then uh, one of my partners in BST says no no don't worry it shows and I was like I feel that came out very wrong. <laughs> no, but it's just that when are, I are when I, so yeah, I was just like, mm, yeah, we are, we are, we are. I, I forgive that one, that one. I forgive that one. No, but I think that when I when I left university twenty years ago after doing law, I mean, everyone I studied with went into the private sector, like law firms. And I said, no, I'm going to go in an advisory firm that uh, advises states on uh, how to get um, children's well-being in the Mediterranean to, to, to be better. And they all looked like me, at me like, you're absolutely freaking insane. You're never going to make any money. And one of the things that I always, always sort of objected to is that when you do human rights, when you do sustainability, when I, when I was young, it was very much we don't pay you because you just do this to do good. I'm like, no, no, I, I studied. <laughs> I, I studied like my, you know, my like tax lawyer colleagues. I studied and it's the same level of rigor and it's the same. Right. I mean, now you can see that there is an interest in also, you know, valuing this sort of experience and this sort of expertise, but you still have a little bit of this, oh, it's, it's soft and floppy. I'm like, no, it's not well, soft well, and yeah. floppy. It's really not. It's, it's, it's a profession. You work your ass off to get the expertise that, that's needed. But we come back to the fact it's an expertise that's rarely found within the companies that are now required to speak about it with authority and i think that that's a major issue and and i would love to see some more cross fertilization from the un or from the ngo sector mm -hmm. into these departments and into these 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 companies but there is a little bit of a problem because it's not the two sectors don't very often combine yes. and yeah. and i mean i i am a very odd person in the sense i left the un during a pandemic <laughs> and started to say, okay, I am going into a sector where I know no one, but I can see that there's a real interest. And I just feel that I have something to offer there because I've never changed my path, you know? And, and that's also something that I see a lot in these discussions is that people come and say, oh, at a certain point now I found my purpose. And like, I've always had my purpose. What are you talking about? Right, and, right. But, but I can really see that there is there is such a need now to have sustainability professionals, be it on the environment. I mean, technically speaking, for instance, if somebody comes to me and say, I want to do decarbonization, I'd be like, sounds great. No idea. We have a partner who does, though, because exactly. otherwise we would be lost, right? But there is a need to know, to have people internally or use people like us who have done this for 
ever because right now this is becoming so prominent there are so many things that are coming out regulatory wise that it's needed to have that it's not i mean with all due respect for the people who come right out of university now they're clever most of them probably they have an amazing education but they don't have 25 years of experience no and i would also and i would also say going back to your original point it's the fact that the the place where we both sit is humanizing the problem because it's not fluffy gender representation is not fluffy you know sustainability is not fluffy racial equity is not fluffy because under all of this sits real horrific experiences it's changing it's pushing to change society at a fundamental level and the key and this is why you know you and I understand each other so well is the key about it is is being able to translate that experience and in my case it's 14 years of working in asset management translate that experience into exactly. what does it mean to have worked in this industry what does it mean to have sat there as a woman as a black woman and what is it that you need to be able to redress the balance within your corporation exactly. and you have done you know the past 20 years you've, you've worked with you know NGOs and the UN and you've you understand it from how governments try to fix it and you're bringing that knowledge to corporates to asset managers, to hedge funds, to investment banks, because the, the, the translation is missing because, yeah. you know, never before have has this been sought out in the way it's been sought out now. No. 2020 was a year of reckoning. 2020 was when the world stopped and looked and said, we have a pandemic. Racial inequality is now in our faces. We cannot ignore it. And, and then on top of all of that came the highlight, the highlighting of all the other inequities, inequalities that face, that are faced. And behind all of it was, well, there is one space that can make the biggest change, the private sector. Yeah. And if you want to still be able to play in this and say you are, you know, it can't just be, I saw a post yesterday on LinkedIn, which is like, you know, someone said, why do you come for the job? And the person said, money, why did you hire me? Well, we hired you because money. It yeah. can't be no. that motivation no. No. is no. money. And no. it can't just be that it's just lip service, but it's also about making sure that you're you're engaging the right people to do the right job for you. Because if if you don't get this right now, as you said before, Christina, there's enough regulation coming in the next few years to me. So I propose that we do this, this, and this. Like first mini step is this, and then you do this, and then you, and then you get the reaction. Oh yes, that's really good, and it's true. This is this is not this is not working, and then, and then you have the, and then it goes. Yeah, but we've always done it like that. And then I just want to scream. <laughs> that's just when I went. Yes, and do you feel it working for you? The you know? reason why we're here, where we are today, is because we've done a lot of a lot of things. I mean, I had a conversation with someone recently, and they said, you know, when you go back into history, just because it was legal doesn't mean it was right. No, exactly. And, and this is where we are. There's a lot of things that have been done and they've been done under legal frameworks. They've been done under corporate behavior, company culture, you know, all these things. But it doesn't make them right. And the fact the fact that, you know, it was funny that you picked BlackRock because yesterday I spoke about BlackRock culture and that the fact that they're trying to, um, you know, change their culture and invest, you know, change their the credit terms that they offer to black and Latino community. They want more women by, um, I think they said by 2030 as well, uh, increments by 3% each year, et cetera, et cetera. You know, there's, there's a lot of companies that are saying stuff, but as we both said, the commitment has to be there to follow through on the impact. You know, BlackRock's one of the largest voices requiring that um, anywhere, anywhere they invest, they have to align themselves with ESG framework, but are they doing the sell, the, 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 the the yeah. same for themselves and these are the things you know what we both what we both really require of anybody who does work with us is that they are committed to making the change and understanding that the work will not be done within a year yeah. two years because the fund the, the foundations that this has been built on have been there for longer than you know five generations yeah and also realize that uh, i mean for instance if you come from from the investment sector you have a specific competence that you can use you you need now to figure out how to twist it or tweak it into using it in in a different way but it's not saying goodbye to your competence right it's a little bit it's it's how do you because we all still want to have 
and prove that there is a return on investment. But right. sometimes you need to use what you have. And if you are a senior investment or portfolio manager or asset manager, use what you know, but then say, okay, so here I can get you 5% on your investment. But on the top of that, well, Christina and Leanne just told me that you'll do this, this, and this, and this. So instead of getting 10% on your investment and then throw 5 million to charity, this is what I'm actually su suggesting that you do. And these are the ways you can, for instance, scale up a small firm that is producing plastic out of algae. Because if we manage to get rid of the plastic, then we've actually solved some issues in the world, right? right. And not just for the people who where the plastic is actually floating in the floods because they don't have like 10 different things where you throw things out as we do in Geneva. But uh, I mean, when I, when I buy fish, there are little microplastic things in them too because the world is connected. Correct. There's, 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 I love that. The world is connected. And I think, yeah. hold on. So I, I'm aware of the time, which is awful because I, I want to talk more, but I, I'm going to I'm gonna put some comments up. So <laughs> that's a question today. <laughs> uh, yes. Which in, in considering who John, whom I know, who is actually one of the BST partners now, is we, we decided, so as I said, we started out being three women with a human rights and international law background. Then we decided to give John, who is a white investor, male, European, a chance. So, I mean, you know, it, diversity and inclusion. So, but I think that as you say, John, I mean, in this, in the people you speak with really ought to know. I remember I heard the term ESG not a terribly long time ago because I've always worked SDG related. So I was like, mm. and then I was like, oh, that's how they speak about it. <laughs> I love that. I, I, I love that. That's how they speak. Exactly. Yeah. Wonderful language, Christina. Wonderful language. I'm just, I'm just going to clip that and be like, this is Christina. This is Christina. That's how they speak. That, that exactly. is what we have. Yeah. Like. Now, now oh. I speak. See, this is integration and inclusion. Now I speak about it like that too. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on. Annie, uh, very good comment. Right, like, you cannot make a solution for something you don't understand or experience. That's why co-creation with communities is crucial for sustainability. A hundred percent, definitely. Um, hi, Kareem. Thanks so much for watching us from the Philippines. I'm going through quickly because I'm aware of uh, the time that we have. So, da -da -da. thanks, John. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna clip this especially for me. <laughs> <laughs> I also love I love otters. If you get it right, that means you, if you get if I get it right, that means you need to not only asset management plus, but also experts in environment, social matters. Exactly. Right. I think it really is about drawing on each other's expertise. <laughs> no, it is. It to to. to to be able to really make the impact as much as we need to, then you can't have now a vision. You can't you can't have blinkers on. No. You have to. I mean, let's face it, nobody would ask me to invest their money for them, right? For good reason. <laughs> so why is it that you go to people that you ask for return on investment and ask them about sustainability issues? Right. I just don't, I don't get that one. Right. It's like I, I would not go to my vet to get my teeth done. I said something like that. You wouldn't bring your car to the dentist. Right. It's 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 being able to admit you don't know, but it's also being able to find the right expert for what it is you need. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Hold on one second. Fazella says racial and economic qualities are still intact in our society, even in even. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep, access to vaccines by the mm -hmm. oh, yeah. right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. This is. Uh, sometimes you know this sounds terrible but sometimes you could be overwhelmed by the you know overwhelmed with the level of distressing news but I think this is why it's important to take one step at a time and this is why you know each person there are there are enough experts because nobody and I think this is the one thing I always like to say is nobody can be an expert at everything no exactly exactly and I think also you know listen to people when you say so these are the practical steps to take you know as, as we were just discussing now the first thing you can ask in in supply chain is 
What are your internal processes? Don't start investigating everything in your supply chain from one day to another. I mean, you'll just be overwhelmed and, and have a burnout. Right. I said, I didn't know. It's also not possible. But say, okay, so what is it that I'm looking for? What is it that I want to happen if things go wrong? How much is the level of engagement from my supplier? Is it that I'm looking for in order to say this is acceptable or no, I'm going to somewhere else? And also, I mean, legitimately measure that against the risks of what will happen to you if, for instance, you operate in or with Europe, if you don't do that. And as a supplier, be aware that if you're not up to standards, the moment these rules and regulations come out and, and will apply to anybody operating in and out of Europe, it will be the easiest thing to be compliant for the for the company here to just say, okay, then I don't use you. It might cost me a little bit more to use somebody else, but at least I won't get hit with a massive fine from my member state or from the EU. So as right. a supplier, it's also really in their interest to up their game so that once these things come out in Germany, in France and from the EU, it will not be, the result will not be, oh, sorry, you're not doing this, this and this. Well, my easiest option as an, invest, as an investor or as a company based here in Europe is to say, not using you. Right, right. Hold on. I've seen two more questions, two more points. Hold on. Um, Stacey, I think, were you asking me about 2020 being a year of reckoning? If you're asking, is that perspective global? Yes. Um, I think with the combination of COVID, but then also seeing what happened, the murder of George Floyd, and now obviously we've got that again in the news with the trial of Derek Chauvin, it's, it's the reverberations have been felt globally because it's, it's caused... I'd say a rupture that was already there, but people are looking at it in a wider perspective. You know, we've had, let's say, and I'm not talking about her specifically, but Britain's come under the microscope for their handling of um, Harry and Meghan Markle. And, you know, all these things, there's, there's a heightened awareness generally socially as mm -hmm. to what's happened, the, the reaction, the fact that there's a trial going on, not that it's a foregone conclusion that he was murdered. This is this is making people question their value, their value as black people, their value as black women, how companies are treating minoritized groups, how companies are treating minoritized groups as a part of their supply chain, how are companies going into countries like China, Bangladesh. So it's, you know, all these things were bubbling under the surface, but 2020 was absolutely the year that everybody is now looking now and it's not to say that everybody wants to change that's one thing I have to make clear not everybody is in the boat but nobody but you can't look away anymore you can and anybody who decides to it's an active decision to not change it's an active decision to look away because it's so prominent it's so in it's so much in everything we do right now, that if you don't want to change, you're ignoring society. So I hope, oh, you said yes. Thanks, Stacey. <laughs> and also importantly, because when you say everybody, this is everybody in the global north. So it's where right. the, the main, the big part of consumers are. It's where a big part of the money is. So it is about that sort of the global north all of a sudden realizing we can't, we, we need to do things differently. And that will then hopefully have a positive impact on all of the people who actually don't have a voice. Right, right. But that that also, I mean, this is another conversation, but that also requires the Global North to be willing to relinquish an element of power that they had in order to have this stake, all this power that we have right now. Because equalising, equalising and saying I still give you permission isn't the same as... <laughs> Right. Or I should say, I should rather say giving people permission isn't the same as equalizing and right. having the same amount of power. No, right. No, no. Um, it was so good. I, I, we've had comments to say it was a great show. Enjoyed listening. Good luck with all the black rocks. And black rocks been called too many times today, but it was just a good example. Well, but when big, they, and they have, no, I mean, when they say something, it, 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 it's, it, it echoes. Right. Right. You know, when when it's there, you know, what can you do? You put yourself in the news, you're going to get talked about. Fazella exactly. calling us babies. She says she's 61. You don't look oh, it. That's, that's <laughs> <please>. Thank you. <laughs> well, we did say that we could talk forever. 
We did. We did. We did say we could talk forever. And you know something, it has been a pleasure and an honour. And it's been such good fun. And I think, you know, the comments have verified that it was such a I have I have learned a lot as well because this has also asked me and this is one of the one of the values that I have as a person, but also for the company, which is challenge assumptions. What I thought I knew, I also didn't know. So thank you also for teaching me something that I can um, that I can also take away. Well, thank you so much for having me here. It was great fun and I'm, I'm sure we'll do it again just to speak more yeah of course yeah. of course yeah. sorry <laughs>